Good evening, everyone. Um, today on World Sickle Cell Day, we are uh, producing a live broadcast from the Sickle Cell Society about um, plans changes in the um, sickle cell pathway in England. Um, my name is Russell Gundry. I'll be moderating the conversation today, and I'm joined by two colleagues from the Sickle Cell Society, Matt and Tracy, if you'd like to introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Matthew. I run the uh, social media for Sickle Cell Society and do the communications. Um, and I'm Tracy, I'm a community development officer. Thanks both. And we're joined by um, three colleagues from NHS England, um, Kerry, South Africa, and Mark, who are also asked to introduce themselves and explain their role in this process. Um, so my name's Kerry Lewis, and I lead on communications and engagement for this um, service review. Uh, Mark Thaxter, and my role is to project manage the service review. So in essence, trying to bring all of the information together in some sort of coherent fashion. And hi, uh, I'm Sarah Palamore, and I provide analytical support for the service review. Thanks everyone. So, for the next hour or so, what we're going to be doing is asking a set of questions um, about the review, understanding what the context of the review is and what it means for patients. Um, we're going to be having that as a, as a, as a Q&A between us, but you can also ask questions by writing a comment um, on the, the bottom right box of your screen. We'll pick those up on the way. We've got some questions that have already been asked to us by patients who've already contributed um, through either the online survey or, or in person, um, and we'll pick those up as we go through as well. So first we'd like to understand a bit about the context of why this review is taking place um, and what the intentions of it are, and I'll ask Kerry to talk us through that briefly. Kerry, over to you. Thanks very much. Uh, so just to explain, we work in specialised commissioning um, at NHS England. So a lot of health services are funded locally through things called clinical commissioning groups that are small local groups that look at how um, uh, much health services are needed and the best way to provide those. But for some services that are particularly expensive or only affect a smaller number of people or affect a small number of people who are not who are sort of spread unevenly across the country, so it wouldn't be fair for one clinical commissioning group to kind of work out how to how to care for that group of people but we fund them nationally so we look at, the, at how care works across the whole country and it's called specialised haemoglobinopathy services and that covers sickle cell, thalassemia and other rare inherited needs. So this service review has been looking at the kind of hospital care that relates to those conditions that is paid for nationally by specialised commissioning. And we've been looking at those services because we know that there's variation across the country. Some people report really good care and the fact that their care has been improving, but in other places people have experienced less good care um, and that when they've moved around the country have experienced differences. Some people haven't had great care in an emergency when they've had a sickle crisis and they've had to pitch up at A&E. So, um, and we also know that there are an, only a small number of specialists, um, doctors and nurses in this area, and a number of them are retiring. We're not getting so many new people profession so we know there are only a few professionals so we have to make the best use of their time um, so that's the reason we've been looking at these services and thinking um, about how the money is spent where the services are provided and whether that's the best thing to patients and whether there's a better way of doing it thank you Kerry okay so that, that gives a bit of a sense as to what the review is about what it's intending to cover and um, what, what some of the potential benefits are um, Again, I'll say that um, if you do want to raise questions or, or add comments, then please do uh, do that again on the bottom right hand comment box um, on your screen. Um, equally, if you're uh, watching this video after it's been broadcast, then you can also add comments as well. Just to cover really quickly, there are several different ways to contribute. So there is an online survey um, which you can complete um, online. We're asking people to do that by the 30th of June. Um, we're running two face-to-face -face consultation events. One of those is in Birmingham on the, um, on the 7th of July. Uh, the second is at the Sickle Cell Society AGM on the 21st of July. Um, and additionally, we are uh, providing support to anybody who runs a support group. Um, if you'd like to run a meeting with your support group and you'd like um, help in, in setting that up to ask these questions um, and get some meaningful feedback, then, then please do contact the Sickle Cell Society. 
Uh, all of the details are on the Sickle Cell website, uh, Sickle Cell Society website, so that's um, www.sicklecellsociety.org. Um, and if you've got any questions, then you can also email info at sicklecellsociety.org. Um, I'll ask Matt to repeat those details at the, at the end of this session. Um, so we, we've got those twice and everything's clear. Um, but just to, to make those things available, uh, again, you can raise some comments on the bottom right hand box. So in terms of the, the Q and A, then it'd be really helpful to get um, just an overall sense of uh, the summary of what the what the scope of those um, those proposed changes are. So, so I, if I could ask you to, to kind of give us a really kind of tight summary of what those proposed changes mean. Absolutely. So in terms of um, just to clarify again, in terms of the services that we're looking at, it's essentially as Kerry said, it's the in hospital care that you would receive um, if you fish up at a hospital with either sickle cell or thalassemia. What it wouldn't be, for example, is if you had a broken knee, you are a sickle cell or thalassemia patient, that would be out of the scope of this review. Um, so that's essentially the area that we're looking at. Should I pass over to Mark now to talk a little bit more about the proposed changes? Please do. Okay. Um, so, so actually undertaken the view, we looked at a lot of information, so a lot of activity in hospitals, that's some of the data. Um, also looked at a lot of peer reviews that were taking place in various human drug marketing services. Um, so as Ken has pointed out, you know, a, few, a few problems that we noticed in terms of access to quality services and areas and so on. So what we wanted to do was come up with a model that was hopefully quite straightforward, but would address those issues and ensure that wherever you are, you've probably got better, better care, uh, and better access to information advice. So what we've looked at uh, really is, is putting in a structure um, to support this. So in essence, we're looking at putting in place what we're calling hemoglobinopathy um, coordinating centers. So these will have an administrative function and a sort of a leadership function. They're not better centers than we currently have for clinical care, but they're there to make sure that the networks are actually supported and developed. Because as Kerry said, you know, we don't have many consultants, it's something like 13 or so whole time equivalents across the country. And there's really not a lot, of, um, a lot of workforce out there, so it's making sure that people can access that. So these centres will be very much based on, um, on leading uh, the networks, developing them, making sure that you can get a better sort of standardised care in, in some cases. There'll also be what we're calling specialised uh, hemoglobinopathy teams. So these are essentially the, the centres that currently exist. So we're not closing anything now, there are, there's no rationalisation going. And these uh, will continue to deliver the service they're delivering, but actually we'll be able to link more closely again with others in their network to make sure that you know, if somebody, say in the middle of Truro or somewhere, has a problem um, and there's a complex case, that there's a way of that person being referred into to service to receive that advice and care. We've also uh, proposed a uh, national hemoglobinopathy panel, and this will be set up over time, and it's role very much will be looking at sort of novel treatments and providing advice and guidance. It won't be rationing care or anything at all like that. What it will be doing is ensuring that people from all over the country have access to that really specialised um, bit of um, uh, clinical care. We're also going to be developing the National Hemoglobinopathy Registry as well, but again, sort of a longer term process. Um, and that's actually trying to make sure that that's, that supports uh, both patients and clinicians more effectively. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, we're actually very interested in hearing people's views on, on, on the NHR and how we should operate in the future. Mm -hmm. that, that's also one of the questions that I think we'd we'll like to come back to on the National Hemoglobinopathy Register because that has been something that's been raised by, uh, by patients too, the, the Sickle Cell Society in the, um, in the lead up. Um, so we, we've got a, um, a few questions coming in, um, and perhaps um, we, we might give a, a couple of minutes just to uh, to those. So that there's um, Miriam, hello, um, asking about um, where the, the room for improvement is, and suggesting that there is quite a lot of room for improvement. This is a good initiative. So thank you. Um, so Rachel is, is asking, um, do you have access to centres that provide comprehensive sickle cell programmes? Uh, yeah. There's perhaps um, one of the questions that we're kind of touching on, but who would like to, um, who would like to pick up that question? I think that was particularly to do with um, sort of the centres, so sort of uh, transfusions and things like that, and how that sort of links in with the uh, new sort of plans. Well, I think it's, as, as Mark explained, the idea of having this 
the, the new coordinating centres is in a way they're kind of a new layer on top of the services that already exist. So we're not suggesting that patients should have to receive their care in a different way. People won't have to travel to a different centre for their regular treatment or transfusions. That will still happen pretty much as usual. But what we did notice and what people told us was that in certain areas, if there's a hospital that's got fewer patients with these conditions, that they're, they're not as confident or as aware of how to treat these conditions, then it's not always obvious where those clinicians might go for advice. So that was the idea of having this strength and network function, that if you're somewhere, I know one of the, um, participants has mentioned Cambridge, maybe somewhere that has fewer people with sickle cell than London, then actually there should be a clear pathway in that area that if, if um, that patient came in and had a particular complex issue they'd never seen before, they would know in that network who to contact, who's the expert on cardiac issues or liver issues, which at the moment works in some places, but we've found that it doesn't work ideally everywhere. So this, the idea is to bring that up so that every area of the country is covered by one of these networks that the coordinating centre would um, be responsible for. So it's kind of admin function. So if in Cambridge, I'm not picking on Cambridge, but if they needed maybe some training for their A&E staff, in their area, the coordinating centre might be able to offer to come in and do some on-the-spot training with the, with the nurses about how you cope with sickle crisis and the best, best sort of practice. So it wouldn't be that people would need to move from that hospital, but that hospital would get better support from their network. That's, what, that's the kind of idea behind it, really. So from the patient's point of view, you wouldn't have to leave your local hospital to travel to the coordinating centre. It, that has a role, really, in supporting the rest of the NHS system mm -hmm. in, in, in caring for people. Okay. Thank you. Um, we, we've got a, a couple of comments from, uh, from Carol and from Lawrence about the desperate need for um, better knowledge in, in hospitals. And uh, as I understand, that's one of the things that this uh, review is really designed to tackle. Yeah. I mean, it, building what Kerry said, really, the, the coordinating centres have a real role in terms of leadership and in terms of education as well. Yeah. So they will, they will have a network and their the expectation will be that they'll be monitored on this is in terms of the training they deliver, the leadership that they show to other clinicians. So yeah, it's, it's all about trying to upskill and have access to that specialised knowledge where otherwise you may not be able to access it. And of course, the, the sickle cell standards have just been uh, re revised and republished, and yeah. um, presumably, then the expectation is that this um, um, focused approach will support uh, delivery of those standards. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, um, I know Amanda's asked a, a little bit about sort of in universities whether that sort of education uh, on this is sort of been delivered even at the very early sort of training stage. Has this got anything sort of to do with that, or with that sort of knowledge trickle down? Not just hospitals, but just sort of early training as well. We have been trying to engage in work with Health Education England on this because it's recognised that actually, you know, there isn't a specific haematopathy qualification or training courses like haematology more generally. Um, and also the fact that we, you know, we don't actually have um, that many clinicians out there either. So we want to try and encourage people to get into it. And one of the, the hopes and aims of this really is as well by by having a, a better system in place for us to access information, access the advice, it may well encourage people to sort of get more involved in it where they can see the sort of difference they can make. Do you get any sense from, from this um, review, and you mentioned earlier, Mark, and, and generally about these um, the challenges of, of actually specialist care and the, the number of uh, specialist mm -hmm. consultants, specialist resources that are available? And presumably, part of the challenge is um, how we provide um, you know, attractive options within education to, to get people more involved. But um, do, do you have any kind of more views in terms of how that might work and how do we bring people in to be um, interested and involved with, with sickle cell and other people? I think with the, the centres, because they'll have a role in terms of um, education and training, they'll also be encouraged to get involved in research. So again, you hope that that's actually going to help drive the profession forward a, a, a bit as well and make that real contractual proposition for people. Mm -hmm. um, certainly it's not something that's really been done before and that's one of the improvements that we really are looking looking to really because we feel that that's going to have a real knock-on effect for, for patient care but it also may well encourage you to, to get involved a bit more as well as I think probably make sure that you know, if there are specialist uh, you know, days that they're actually um, in terms of research education, look at human webinopathy. It's going to spread that knowledge, but it also may just encourage people to get involved. Mm. 
Okay. okay. So this is certainly a sort of much closer alignment between um, practice of care and delivery of care, and then the, you know, the research that's taking place that's enabled by these specialised centres. Understand. Okay. So um, it's also perhaps uh, worthwhile pointing out that um, that we've got um, uh, people joining from uh, as, as far afield as we've got Mariah in Uganda and we've got uh, Jamalou oh, in, uh, in Nigeria. Um, so hopefully this provides an opportunity both to, to network more, more broadly, um, but also to, to recognise that there are um, there's learning that, that can be shared from both this, this work more broadly across the world. Um, and then there's, there's certainly um, some pretty compelling messages there about uh, about the, the improvement needed more, more broadly. Um, and, and Carol, thank you for your comments too about um, about your your experience as well. So that's that's really really helpful and appreciated. And um, just to say to everybody that um, these comments we're, we're making note of, and we'll build those all into um, into the consultation. Um, I'm conscious that we, we've talked um, quite a bit about um, what what's specialised and specialist commissioning means um, and that not everybody will necessarily have an understanding of, of how that relates to um, the overall care that they receive as, as a patient and it would be really helpful if we could get a, a bit of a, an overview of what, what specialist commissioning means um, versus um, some of the, the wider care that people might receive in, for example in primary care from their GP and uh, from community services. Um, so in, in specialised commissioning, I think Kerry might have touched on this at the beginning. Um, so we tend to deal with the more rare and complex diseases. Usually how it's defined would be um, patient calls that are quite small and the amount of spending is often quite high on them if we look at the average amount spent per patient. Um, so in terms of specialised commissioning, we look at a budget of around 15 billion out of total uh, NHS budget of around 130 to 140 billion. Um, and so I think there's around 146 uh, specialised so areas yeah, yeah. that we currently look after. Um, and hemoglobin monopolies is one of those areas. Mm -hmm. um, what that means in terms of for the patients, I guess, in terms of the payments perspective, is that if there's any patient that presents with uh, hemoglobinopathy as a primary diagnosis or in the, in the hospital care, then essentially that payment is then picked up by specialised commissioning by NHS England. That shouldn't really make any difference to the patient, so for them it should be a seamless, flawless um, transition between any, any care that they receive in primary care or community or in the hospital. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, there's some additional questions coming in, but um, Whilst it would be, um, I think, probably helpful to to say that it's that, you know this this is not all about about funding, but but, but equally it'd be really helpful to understand a bit about what what, what changes from a funding perspective um, what will happen and how that influences the review. Absolutely. Um, so to provide some background over here, in uh, 1718 there was some additional money that was pumped into monthly services, and this was basically to recognise that this was a specialist area and therefore there was additional funding that was required. Um, but what we found is that the, the methodology that we used to apply that additional funding wasn't necessarily resulting in the improvements in quality that we would have hoped for. And so what we're going to do now is actually change the way that we pay for those services to reflect a three-tier approach that Mark has, has set out. Mm -hmm. um, so we're not reducing any of the funding that's going to him or the monthly services, the funding is staying exactly the same. It's just that the way that we distribute it is to make sure that actually going to provide or um, support some of the specialist elements. Mm -hmm. And just to explain that it, it was basically, as Sadaka said, it was a new payment that came in mm -hmm. um, and it's been over this past year, so this is the first year we've had this payment, it has right. 5.8 million pounds? Uh, approximately. Yes. Approximately, it was around that So that's the, that basic people might be wondering how are we affording, if it's a new level, how are we going to afford these hemodopathy coordinating centres? And it's basically using that money, which was just sort of dripping into hospital trusts without actually, we found the hemoglobinopathy services actually benefiting from the additional money Absolutely. necessarily. A lot of them weren't aware their hospital was getting additional money because of <laughs> their, their treatment. So we want this to be used in a way that we know what it's been used for, we can account for it, we can see whether it's working. Whereas before, the, the hospitals got a little bit more funding, yeah. over 150 hospitals, I think this money was spread. Mm -hmm. So that had, the, the money that 150 hospitals get, we're thinking could be used for this limited number of coordinating centres to do this new additional function. 
And and that's that's just, as a non-finance person, that's sort of how yes, I've seen how the, where the money's come from. Yeah. And, and that should, and so in slicing and dicing the money in the new way that we've suggested, that should directly be linked to providing patient care, better management of the care. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, because we'll actually specify what we want. So previously, as, as Kira said, money just went in. And as with all hospitals, you know, money comes in from all services, and they will then decide you know, how they're going to fund on the back of that. Whereas now, if we're saying actually we want better leadership and we want uh, better education, we want better coordination, we can specify that these are the roles they want to take. So they're going to have to use that money in that, that context to improve the care. And they will have to demonstrate to the commissioners as yes. well that it's being used for that. So there's more, there's greater monitoring that would take place as well. Okay, okay. So, so that's the, the other side of the, the equation is that how do we actually know that these yes, changes are happening? Yes, yes. Yes. And just to say that one of the things we've made a a part of the coordinating centres is that they will have to demonstrate that they are engaging with local patients to understand not just what works from the clinician's point of view, but where do patients feel that things aren't working. So at the moment, um, if you lived in an area of the country, you know, you, you're one of the few people with sickle cell there and your a &E doesn't know a great deal about how to deal with you when you're having a crisis. But at the moment, it would be quite hard to know who else could you speak to about that. Whereas the idea would be that people should know where their coordinating centre is and can feed back to say, my hospital might need a bit of extra support, I'm one of the few people sickle there, could you, one of your team go out and speak to them? So that has to be one of the new functions. It's, mm -hmm. it's got to be about engaging with patients so they know where things work and where things, where hospitals might need a bit of extra support and um, awareness raising. Okay, okay. So uh, that sounds like quite a clear call to action in terms of sort of saying to mm -hmm. patients, there are ways to get involved in shaping local services. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's an expectation of these new people that come up with these centres that they can demonstrate the level of patient engagement that they've had. And then, pre presumably, will, will patients also be involved in, in, in the definition of what, you know, what does good look like? How do we measure that this is making a positive difference? Is, is, that, is that part of this? Or how does that bit work? Yeah, I, I, suppose, yeah. I suppose that's the part, you know, that's why we want them to engage with people so they actually get a sense of if there were issues before and they didn't know how to, to raise them, there should be a routine that people can say, well, my problem is this doesn't work at my local hospital or they don't have much understanding of this condition. Um, and so it is, it is more of that kind of, um, they say it's not the clinical function so much, it's the kind of understanding what's going on in a patch in a particular area and where services work, work well, where there might be gaps. So that would really, that's more of the role. It's not that people need to go to the coordinating centre for their care, it's more that they have a role in making sure that they have sort of oversight of what's going on in their area and can help when necessary. So that extra funding will mean they can have sort of additional staff to help them actually do that, go out and do the training and all the hands-on stuff. Okay, okay, so a real kind of focus in terms of that, that money which was broadly distributed yeah, and now yes. effectively being um, really channeled into some areas that we Absolutely. believe it will make a difference and yeah. that actually will be really monitoring to make sure that that is spent in the right way. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the, um, the comments that are coming in. And thank you um, to everyone, um, Miriam, Carol, Nagel, and um, Sandra, for, for the comments that, you, that you've put up there. Um, there's a, a theme here about um, uh, the wider scope of, of care. Um, uh, one of the comments that I saw just come up was about um, about benefits needing to have better awareness and within um, uh, benefits for the severity of sickle cells as a condition. And, and I think certainly that's something that crops as there's being a, there's been a common issue. Um, but also um, there are comments here about um, uh, self management, so um, enabling um, more proactive care. Um, possibly you know, outside of a, you know, an emergency setting, um, and, and that more kind of um, focused on the on the sort of primary and community end of, of the spectrum. Um, now I'm aware that the you know the scope of this review is very much around specialised services, but um, do you have any views in terms of how how does this line up with providing a, a better standard of care across um, the, the whole of a patient's um, requirement and how does that enable a more proactive um, form of management? So, so, 
I, I mean, I, I think at the moment the focus, as we said at the beginning, is pretty much on the specialized commissioning side, and it is looking at um, the in hospital care that patients currently receive. Yeah. Having said that, there is generally a move at the moment as we're moving towards what are called system transformation plans to look at trying to commission for primary care as well as community as well as in hospital care. Yeah. So, although we're not there right now, I probably presume within the next few years we will get a much more integrated pathway and things should begin to change. I think beyond that, we can't say too much at the moment because it is evolving at the moment. Okay. But we would hope that the, the, the coordinating centres would then be in a good position to pick up not just where the specialised element of the services are working, but where other things maybe aren't working in the system. And they might not be able to directly influence it, but at least they could be there to feed back to their local clinical commissioning groups, maybe where there are gaps or weaknesses. Mm. I mean, as, you know, as you say, some of the things I can see people are saying around social care, which is obviously under a lot of we all know is under a lot of pressure, and this won't address directly, but hopefully the coordinating centres will have a better idea of what's going on for people in their patch. And, and hopefully they will then, um, you know, um, connect the dots between, well, let's look at what are they, you know, where are patients uh, going in for community and, and for primary care, rather than at the moment it will be at each individual hospital will have to try and figure out those patient pathways. So hopefully it will streamline some of the deaths that patients have at the moment. Yes, okay. Um, I see a few comments um, sort of looking at um, things to do with uh, support and sort of to do with DWP um, and to do with benefits, which isn't really sort of, uh, yeah. covered in this, but so, you know, the society has been working with the all party parliamentary group for sickle cell thalassemia uh, on this, particularly looking recently at the um, PIP payments. Um, so, if you do have any concerns around sort of benefits or there's any issues you're having, please do email us. Um, info at sicklecellsite.org, uh, and then we'll pass that on to our parliamentary officer. That's what we're really looking at at the moment. Uh, so, yeah, if you have any worries about that, then please do email us. Thanks, Matt. So, yeah, so that there is a, a broader agenda, and certainly from the, the Sickle Cell Society perspective, then it would be great to receive that um, that feedback. And of course, thank you for your comments here. Um, th there are um, a, a couple of comments, particularly around um, you know, care for, for, for children. Um, and also um, from um, you know, young people at, at university. So there's this kind of wider theme, um, which is um, you know, sort of people at uh, particularly vulnerable times, how, how do they how do ensure that they receive a, a good standard of care? Um, so I think it's probably it, you know, to, to sort of bring together that, that sort of previous um, mm -hmm. uh, dialogue that, that, you know, that there's an awareness that, that this is a, a foundational change which, which supports improvement in, in specific areas, so you know, hospital, um, but also that as a result of that, we may also see um, additional changes that, that start to, to come from that that, that impact um, the care that people receive more broadly. Um, and I think the clear commitment from the civil cell society that you know that those kind of broader issues are certainly um, you know, very important from, from that perspective. Um, in, in terms of, um, I suppose, children and young people, and, and anything else to, to add there, I suppose that there is always this concern about, uh, particularly when, uh, you know, when, when children, uh, for example, leave, leave home and go to university, mm -hmm. that uh, it's, you know, it may be a very challenging time to, to manage that condition. So, presumably, that, that's part of this kind of overall improving standard of care is that some of those more vulnerable times are recognised and, and, and managed. And, and also by us having um, the National Neuropathy Panel and the ACC, the whole idea is that they can then share best practice. Because at the moment, one of the issues that we have is that if um, if you know, a young adult moves from a hospital where they have great care to another hospital, there might be a lot of variation in the care they receive. The idea at the moment is, is actually to provide a homogenous service or better standards across the country. And we're hoping that that shared then will, will be a result of the new model. Okay. okay. So, so, so it's sort of like a real consistent Absolutely. service across the country. That's right. And I guess the other thing is that the DNA, the, the sort of the work around the hemoglobinopathy registry could also help that as well. So we're looking to know that. So how could that you know, help support individuals if they move around or maybe yeah. care plans or whatever else? We know it's an underused resource, and we know that you know not everyone is entered onto it. For example, so you know it is something that, that we see as, as being a, a real tool to try and improve that. Yeah. So at the moment it's really just some, sort of a head count, it's just a way of 
counting people who've got these conditions. Uh, but in some, uh, some conditions, I think in haemophilia, the register's used a lot more proactively so that if people do move, they can upload their care plans. If you go into A&E, other clinicians can access your care records. Um, so they're the sorts of things we're thinking, could, could that help? Would we, could the NHR, could that be made into something more useful that people can actually use to help manage their care so they have their care plans and their medication records to be accessible on the internet. Um, obviously there'd be kind of potentially concerns people have about their data being stored somewhere, but that's the sort of thing we have to talk through with people. So as I say, there's no firm plans on that yet, but we'd be interested to hear if people think there, there are ways forward to use that. I mean, the same way people use health apps and all sorts of things these days, could we use the NHR as a basis for better capturing that? So it moves with people, that's, mm -hmm. that's I think, and that came up a lot in the focus groups we did, that that was a big crunch point for young people when they moved to university or to a new job, and suddenly they're very busy, they're having a great time, you know, some of their, um, some of the usual care might fall behind and might not register with the GP quickly and so that's where it can fall down so we thought actually that the NHL could be something that could be better used to, to capture that sort of information which there isn't really anything at the moment. Okay, okay, so, so it would really broaden in its scope and usefulness from being effectively you know, almost yeah, a, yeah. a head council to, to actually being a resource that people could mm -hmm. use to uh, practically self-manage their condition or but this sounds like there's a number of different directions that that could go in and that patient feedback would be critical to shaping that. Yeah, absolutely. So this is just throwing out the question to see what people think and then if any changes were proposed, obviously that would, you know, we would have to go back to people and consult on that, you know, before any changes were made. But really we're just thinking, what do people think at this stage? Okay, okay, thank you. Um, so in terms of the um, in terms of the questions that we're that we're getting in here, there's there's a real kind of broad um, uh, theme of questions about um, about awareness of, of sickle cell, um, and obviously today's um, is World Sickle Cell Day, and um, and there's a there's an understanding actually that the condition isn't, isn't very well uh, necessarily very well understood. Um, I think that that's probably something that is is very helpful from. From, from our perspective, but I suppose from also from a, um, an NHS England perspective. Um, but maybe there's a couple of questions here actually. One is, um, uh, Gozi is asking, uh, what, what are NHS England? So I think perhaps it, that would be a, a useful question to, to answer. Uh, it's a good question actually, it's sort of a foundational one. Um, and, and secondly, um, you know, any thoughts in terms of what, what can be done, um, perhaps as a, as a part of this, to, to raise uh, awareness of Sickle cell. I think we've talked about that a little bit in terms of connection between research and practice. But um, is there anything else that these uh, new um, hemoglobinopathy centres could be doing to, to raise awareness of the trade? Who'd like, who'd like to, to cover the what is an interesting? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, technically, it's an arm's length body of the government. So it's the it's the body that oversees the NHS in England, essentially. Um, as we mentioned at the beginning, for people who missed it, most of people's hospital care, if you have a hip operation or a hysterectomy, or most of the care, sort of routine, not routine, but you know, the most of the things that you might have treatment for is paid for locally by local clinical commissioning groups. But our bit of NHS England is called specialised commissioning, and so most people wouldn't be that familiar with what we do, because as we've said, it's the quite rare conditions, the kind of expensive treatments. So to give an example, some of the other things um, within our team are prosthetics, prosthetic limbs, um, very highly specialised infectious diseases. So there are sort of things that are quite rare and they're actually paid for nationally. So the NHS England has a number of functions, but our function is that as the direct commissioner of these rare and expensive treatments, mm. roughly speaking. Okay, okay. Thank you. That's a, a pretty good summation, <laughs> a pretty quite complex, um, complex model. Um, thank you. And, and then the, the, uh, the sort of the, the second um, question around awareness, this kind of consistent theme of lack of awareness of sickle cell. Um, any thoughts in terms of what, what are these changes mean for awareness or what, what might the opportunities be for, for better raising awareness? So again, I think by having that administrative layer um, of the ACCs, that should in itself facilitate better um, awareness of sickle cell and thalassemia and how that's shared learning across the country. So I think that's probably the best way yeah. that would, it would 
amazing by the sun. And of course, there's also the education and training element as well. So I think, again, by improving the education and training of consultants, of nurses, um, across wider areas of the country where we don't have such high prevalence population prevalence of these um, of sickle cell or thalassemia, that again, I think, will raise awareness. Um, I think probably it's worthwhile saying that um, inevitably a lot of these questions are, you know, they're big questions and they're complex mm -hmm. and it's actually, you know, that um, part, part of the objective today is to be able to um, clarify the changes and to, to answer the questions that we can and engage people in a dialogue, but also that a lot of these questions are, are fundamental to making sure that the future services are designed in a way which is best meeting patient needs. So I think that's perhaps something back to, um, to, to the, the people raising these really helpful questions is that also but they they get uh, taken forward into, um, into the design of these, of these services. Um, because there's, there's quite a few um, uh, people pointing out, um, I think some um, to do quite, quite negative experiences, um, uh, 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 both um, awareness in the workplace, Having to travel um, quite quite a long way to, to receive quality of care. Um, some people saying that um, actually they we tend not to go into A&E because the, the, the sort of standard of care that they receive uh, isn't what they would expect. Um, and so I suppose there's, there's quite a lot of feedback there in terms of some of the challenges around quality of care, which of course I think is uh, a lot of what we're trying to address. Um, a few people talked about um, sickle cell treatment. Uh, and sort of getting, getting symptoms from that, which isn't sort of traditionally what you hear when you sort of hear of sickle cell disease, sort of suffering and sickle cell trait, just having it and not having any sort of symptoms with it. But they're sort of saying otherwise that they know people or they are people who are sort of having crisis and things like that, even though they've just got trait. Yeah. Um, and that's sort of, I guess, there's probably less research into that. So I think, is more is going to be into that? And um, how does this model affect? Sort of the research and who gets to sort of benefit from that research? Uh, I don't think it affects research in the way you're talking about particularly. I mean, one thing it might be worth mentioning is, um, because we haven't talked about it much, is the idea of setting up this um, national panel um, is to kind of address some of the issues that we know there are going to be some new, potentially very expensive treatments, ones that aren't going to be available to everybody overnight. So one of the reasons for setting up the panel was to think about, well, how do we ensure that when there's new treatments available at Hospital A, it's not just patients at Hospital A that have access to that treatment. So it's about thinking who's going to best benefit from that treatment, um, you know, and finding ways to do that in a way that's fair. And I think that would, might be the same for kind of research trials and so on. Like who, who's actually going to benefit most from being in that research trial um, in a way that is a bit fairer. So we bring together kind of experts from the the, um, the coordinating centres across the country, so that there is some sort of transparency and. Um, openness about who's making those decisions as those things become available. And obviously at the moment we know they're on the horizon and we know that there's advances in those treatments but they're not quite here yet. So it's about thinking ahead and thinking well, you know, if we know these things are going to uh, come uh, in, the, in the near future um, and we know it's not going to be that everybody can get these things overnight. Um, and we see that a lot in specialised commissioning because it is the area where we have new, very expensive drugs and treatments that people hear about and obviously want access to, but we have to find a way of making them available in a way that's kind of fair and takes into account kind of who will benefit the most and all those kind of things rather than just who's got that consultant. So that's one of the points of having a panel. So I'm not sure about answers your research question, but it is about that sort of when new things become available, we want to have something in place that can kind of, um, yeah, kind of check that we're doing that in, in a way that is, is fair and reasonable. Okay. And I assume that would apply, I don't know if people have mentioned that, some gene therapy, I guess that would say fair. Exactly, yeah, exactly. If they're exactly the sorts of treatments that we know are, you know, are, are sort of on the cusp of being uh, real treatments. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so that sort of describes then um, the creation of an intelligent model that um, allocates treatment fairly, um, and you know, not just because somebody happens to live in a particular area, yeah, yeah. Um, but that, that sort of resource is managed across the, the whole system in the best way possible, being this kind of vision for, um, for, for what managers England are, are setting out to achieve. Um, okay, then there was a specific question from um, Omo about, about prescriptions, um, a question mark about um, 
about whether sickle cell patients should be excluded from um, cost of prescriptions. Um, now, I'm, I'm not sure that that's a question that we can answer today, but um, yeah, anything else to, to add on to, um, to, to the, the, the questions about um, how people receive access to uh, specific treatments as a result of these changes, or what we already covered, what needs to be covered? So, I don't think it should really impact um, the way patients will access services. Mm -hmm. The whole idea is that um, as a result of the changes that are taking place, Patients will still access their services in their local DGH or their local hospitals. Um, they probably, well, some of them should see an improvement in the care that they receive because um, if they are in a place where, for example, as we've seen, some areas which are saying this being poor patient experience, the whole idea is that we actually try and reduce those poor patient experiences and improve that. Um, but otherwise, it really shouldn't be any change in the way patients access treatments. There won't be any reduction in, the, in any of the care that they receive. So the whole idea is that it's just basically a Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, in, in terms of some of the, the other questions that are coming up here, we've got um, uh, again questions about well, how will um, things like local authorities and voluntary sector um, be supporting these changes? And um, it seems from this discussion that, that it's critical that um, those two things work closely in partnership in, in parallel to make sure that the uh, the plan changes in acute or hospital are um, are connected to the sort of the, the wider delivery of care, and that's all joined together in a way which which benefits patients. So it feels incumbent from these questions that that's done, and also um, then there's a point back to um, the voluntary sector organisations, including the civil society, um, in in that as well. Um, so I want to start if you could quickly sort of summarise some of the changes that are happening so just sort of join the discussion. I think a few people have just joined. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, brief overview and summary. summary. Um, so yeah, in summary, what we're, we're actually proposing. So actually take a step back from that. The review that we've undertaken has looked at all sorts of uh, data, so you know, all the stuff around activity, all the stuff around quality, uh, lots of peer reviews, uh, workforce issues as well. So what we've found out is that you know, networks are really key to delivering really high quality service. Um, so what we're doing is establishing um, these hemoglobinopathy coordinating centres, which are there to manage networks, so they're there to uh, provide education, training, support, um, they're there to administer the network function, so look at all the research as well that, that's, that's, um, that's been talked about as well. And they're there to link really the, the specialist teams. So in essence, we're not getting rid of any teams at all. The numbers stay the same. NHS England currently uh, contracts with a number of them, and they will still still be the same. We're improving the service specification, which means that we will hopefully be holding them to account for the service they deliver a bit more than perhaps we have done. Um, and we're also ensuring that the funding for that is coming from existing funding which came into the, the system uh, a year ago. We're really trying to concentrate that funding on the bits of the service that we feel are going to have the biggest benefit. Thank you. Okay, so, so hopefully in response to the, the couple of questions um, coming in, thank you for the reminder um, that, that, that we need to reiterate um, some of the proposed changes, then hopefully that um, answers those questions. And of course, um, if, if it doesn't, or you've got additional questions to add, then please do add comments either either now um, or, or after um, after this broadcast. So if you add comments to the video, which will be saved on the Sickle Cell Society um, Facebook page, you can comment and ask questions then, and we will take those on board as well. Um, so, so yes, we, we will. Uh, we will record the answers and, and put them up later. Um, so, a uh, uh, I'm not I'm sorry, I think I've probably mispronounced your name there, but um, just a, a point about struggling to hear. So, I think that's probably a, a point for us to all speak up and we'll, we'll speak <laughs> clearly into that microphone as well. Um, in terms of the other things that are coming in, uh, quite a few people are, are mentioning things like um, the Single Cell Trade Journal on Facebook, and they're also referencing things like research taking place in Australia and North America. I think more broadly that's um, uh, suggested that, that we need to be paying attention to those things. And also, I think in the way that some of those comments are phrased, people are suggesting that um, some of that information could be uh, made more easily available to, uh, to, to, to people in, in the UK 
Um, we also we saw that there were um, people joining more broadly that actually from a sort of single cell society and more a community perspective that we want to make that information as available as possible. Um, and I'm just looking through the, um, the, the additional comments. Um, there's, there's a kind of a consistent theme again here about um, the, the level of awareness of, of, of healthcare professionals um, towards um, sickle cell. Um, so but there being, as I think, probably a, a bit of a wider question, but it's, you know, how do we create better awareness um, from within the healthcare professional community about you know, sickle cell disease, sickle cell traits, and understanding more about what people um, with sickle cell are, are, are dealing with and going through. Um, folks, I, I think what we'll what we'll do um, we, there's there's quite a lot of, um, uh, of, of quite specialised questions around um, some of the different types of care um, that, that people receive, and there's um, some um, very helpful stories. So, thank you again for for contributing those things. Um, what I suggest is that we, we probably um, try and try and start to, to wrap up um, some of the sort of broader questions, and again. Um, just to give um, some level of feedback to the people contributing questions. Yes, we will um, both um, explain the, the answers that, um, that, we've, that we've provided today. Um, also, we'll, um, we'll make this um, information available afterwards on the Single Cell Society um, website. Um, got Ngozi, um, again, say, um, uh, making the point that GPs lack awareness of uh, single cell disease. Um, so whilst that, that is you know, outside of the scope of this, of this specific um, consultation, that there is this kind of um, uh, awareness that actually that needs to be improved in a, in a primary care or, or GP context as well. And certainly um, from our perspective, that's, um, that's very helpful. Um, and thanks to Bart for the, the point there about, um, about universities, that actually the, the people need to be uh, made aware of their education and also um, in, in the context in which patients receive, um, receive care. Can I just make a point, because people have mentioned about GPs, and although, although this review isn't about GP care or primary care, um, I think one of the ideas was that um, if a network works well, then in each area, GPs should be able to know what is, which, what, where is the coordinating centre that if they have a patient that has a complex um, concern, where do they go to for that advice? Because one of the things we've heard is that for a and &E staff and for GPs, there are so many rare and complex conditions out there that they are never going to fully understand all of them. You know, you can try people saying about doing learning modules that some nurses have to do like 10 in a week or something because there are so many different conditions coming up that you need to be aware of that you, you can't contain all of that. But if you know where to get advice, if you know who to call who does know about it, then that's the really important thing. So one of the things we looked at was better sort of online training modules for nurses and so on. And then we thought, well, actually, People are saying that they can't take in anymore. They're so busy in a &E, they can't take it in. It's, it's more about them. where do they go for that advice? Who do they phone? Who, where is the local clinician that uh, is the expert in this? So it was about the access to the expert advice and guidance. Yes. That was one of the things that came across. So hopefully, and again, with hopefully in the next year or so, as we see how these things pan out, we'll be able to assess, has this made a difference? Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, that's a really good point. So, so actually, you know, sort of there, there's this um, you know, request for more information, but actually it'd be critical to know who is the right person to ask and where yeah. do I get that right information from. Yeah. Uh, and that will be a, a, a critical success factor of people has this as this point of view. I think the thing is that's important to remember that although we're looking to, to get these um, coordinating steps in place by the 1st of April of next year um, and these other changes, it's going to take a while for that to really happen. So it's not as if you'll wake on the 2nd of April and it will be absolutely changed and different because some of this is about cultural change, but it's also about establishing those networks, and that will take a bit of time. Mm -hmm. So we expect those improvements to happen over a period of time. It won't suddenly be an immediate change. Um, as you can imagine, actually, because you know, we're, we're talking about establishing the networks, setting up things like education, training, setting up support, so it is going to take a, a bit before that's really noticeable. Okay, okay, so so we'll just um, people should expect that things yeah. will, will change on a, on a gradual basis, but um, but also be assured that you know when it's not bad. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so, so I think um, um, that, that, that's been a, a very helpful discussion. We're, we're getting some additional comments in, in terms of um, uh, patient experiences and, and also in terms of um, that, that consistent issue of, of awareness and some helpful suggestions in terms of 
what can be done to improve that? I think again, from a, from a sort of voluntary services perspective, that, that feedback is very helpful. So, um, thank you very much. Um, one of the, I suppose, the sort of concluding thoughts then, I'm conscious that people will have joined this, this conversation late, so um, it'd be really get, great to, to get a summary of, um, uh, in, in, in a few words, um, these proposed changes. What, what, what impact um, does this really mean for patients, and what will they see? Um, and how does it benefit them? So just as a sort of quick summary of, of the sort of the quite long conversation that we've had would be really helpful. So, so I think it basically means that they should be able to get better patient care um, at their local place where they're going right now, so the local hospital. Um, there'll be more equitable services that will be around the country, so we expect there'll be better care across. Um, I think that's pretty much, I guess, what we're saying at the moment. And sort of clearer routes. For, for patients to, to to be able to feed back when things haven't worked so well and to know who in their area coordinates and supports the hospitals in their area to, to be better really at that caring for them. So it's it's about making sure that, the, that a lot of it will be about kind of patient education and information as well, that they know where should I go for this particular complication or this issue and that, that they'll be sort of responsible for um, yeah, keep making people aware of, the, of, of how care should work done locally, but that they can feed that when it doesn't. Okay. okay. And, and there also should be, as a result of this, um, better education and training for some of the work staff, workforce that's currently in place as well. Mm -hmm. So I guess some of the complaints that we've been getting right now, hopefully that should reduce over the next few years. Yeah. Well, I think the main thing is it's, this isn't a radical change. We hope this is kind of building and strengthening networks and the way that hospitals work together so that people don't need to move further to get better care, but that hopefully the system is better able to support each other, the hospitals across the system, so that people can carry on getting on with their lives wherever they live. Mm -hmm. um, this isn't about kind of rationalising services or having fewer services at all. It is about ensuring people can just get care where they do now. Mm -hmm. So it shouldn't impact dramatically, but we hope over time people will start to see improvements and know what to do when things aren't working so well. Okay, okay, great, thank you very much. Uh, and and I'm, so that's a really helpful summary, thank you for that. Um, just, just seeing some of the sort of final comments coming in here. Uh, there's some uh, specific questions coming in about things like prescriptions. Um, and I think from our discussions, we've, uh, we've agreed that there will be a kind of Q&A which is put together that yeah. helps to clarify uh, the responses to some of those questions. Yeah. Um, there's a, a lot of additional um, feedback which I think is really helpful, um, both for um, the specific scope of this consultation, but also for services more um, more broadly, um, and a lot of um, great ideas about what can be done to to build awareness as well. So thank you very much for that. Um, also, probably just pulling out some of the, the last comments are talking very much about the need for um, individualising care plans. So uh, just probably a note to say that those have been uh, understood that actually that, that care does just vary uh, based on the needs of an individual. Um, and we talked earlier about um, potentially some of the roles that things like the development of the National Clinical Pathologies Registry could, could play in that. Um, so some, some good ideas for further development as well, which we yeah. have to take forward. Um, as we um, start to, to draw this uh, conversation to, to a close, um, just to say um, to, to people who've contributed, uh, firstly, thank you very much. Um, but also, and Charlene, thank you for, for your um, volunteering of, of, of making awareness, and that's, that's also really helpful. Um, one more thing to say is that, is, is that this, um, this is a, a collective effort, um, so actually uh, for, for those participating in this conversation, um, there are a number of ways to, to get involved, and actually I think it would be helpful if we summarise those again. So perhaps yes, over yeah. to you, Matt, uh, yeah. to explain what those ways are. Yeah, yeah, I've seen a few comments of saying that patient involvement is important, and we definitely agree. Um, so we uh, have an online survey, which can be found at our website, which is sequelcellsociety.org. And this survey um, has all the information which has been talked about today, and you can give your feedback like you have now, um, and just say sort of, what things you think are going to work well and what things you want to see, uh, any issues you see with these proposed plans as well. The more information we can get, the more patients we can get feeding back, the better that is that we know that we're, uh, things will be changing uh, for the good based on what patients want. Uh, we're also doing some events which will be similar to this but in person. Uh, we have one in Birmingham on the 7th of July. Um, you can find that on the, uh, will be on the Facebook page uh, we'll have an event bright as well for that. Uh, we're also going to be dedicating some time at our AGM, which is on the 21st of July, and that's in London. Um, 
to do the yeah, that also on Facebook and on Eventbrite. Uh, if you come along to that, there'll be a chance for you to give your feedback in person and ask questions, uh, as well as a chance to sort of fill in those surveys. Um, uh, we're going to be working with support groups. If you're part of a support group or you run a support group, um, then you should be receiving an email from us uh, with an information pack about how you can talk about it in your support group. Um, if you don't receive that in the next couple of days, then send us an email at uh, info at singlecellsociety.org. We can provide that information for you. Um, and it would be good just to dedicate a meeting um, to really discuss this and get what uh, yeah, people in your support group really feel. Um, it's all on the website, singlecellsociety.org. And if you have any questions, you can email info at singlecellsociety.org. And also, everything coming through today, uh, on Facebook and other comments uh, we'll be looking at as well. Yeah. Thank you, Matt. Um, thank you very much. So, so that's a range of um, options and opportunities to, to contribute. Um, it's really just critical to stress that um, th this is a great opportunity um, to, to, to shape the future of um, services for sickle cell, um, both within the context of um, care and hospital um, but also we're really interested to hear um, how that connects to the care in which people receive um, more broadly. So making sure that that's um, joined up in the right way. Um, we want to get as much feedback as we can. So please do take the opportunity to, um, to both share your views, uh, but also to share this around other people um, who, who would be um, able to play a role in, um, in providing feedback, um, in getting these messages out there and, and getting those views and voices heard. Um, and thank you again to the, there's, there's an additional um, people suggesting that they'll be able to, to support this effort to, to grow awareness. That's really helpful. Um, thank you very much. Um, thanks to Tracy for, for capturing up. You'll probably see in the back corner there that we've got um, quite a long list of questions which, which Tracy's been uh, studiously capturing just to, just to give some assurance that we are um, making sure that we've got notes of those and, uh, and, and so as we can um, both uh, build those into the Q&A. Um, and also making sure that those will be built into the design of future services. Um, thank you to, uh, to, to Kerry, to Mark, and to Salaf from NHS England for, uh, for joining us here today and to, uh, for answering all the questions that have come up. Thank, thank you all. You. No, thank you for inviting us. Yeah. It's been really helpful. Thank you. Okay. And, uh, and, and finally, uh, but, but not least at all, uh, thank you to all of you for participating. It's been a, it's been a fantastic um, a, a amount of dialogue and um, some great questions coming in. I know that we haven't been able to do all of them justice today, um, but again, please do keep commenting, please do um, share this link and please do circulate it around um, your friends and communities and people you know. So thank you again. Good night.